This is a time and place for the community meeting for District 3. We're very happy to be here with you. And if we will do our best to follow the program and be out in a little more than an hour and a half. The first item on our agenda is to welcome the Blair High School Junior ROTC under the leadership of Sergeant Turner. As you know, at all of my community meetings, we have the Pledge of Allegiance. You are not, to requ you are not required to participate in any way. However, we would like those who would like to participate to be able to do so. So we have Marianas Salido, Magali Flores, Paige Espadas, Private First Class, Justin Ramirez, Elliot Miller. Please present colors. Please stand. Part time, part. Left, left, right. Left, left, right. I'd like to introduce Ellen Hernandez, private first class, who will lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. Left. Please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. Place your right hand over your heart. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, individual, with liberty and justice for all. We always want to recognize our young people in our community. So I, if you would, if you'd give them a round of applause for being here tonight, I'd greatly appreciate it. Thank you, and you may be seated. Now I would like to recognize uh, the gentleman who heads this particular place of worship, house of worship. and. Oh God, I should have pronounced so. <laughs> um, let me just say this about Pasadena Presbyterian Church. Historically, Pasadena Presbyterian Church has had a strong commitment to the community and particularly the minority community. They've had tremendous programs over the last 40 years and I have actually benefited from some of those programs. So the new executive priest for Pasadena Presbyterian Church it's Steve Vibi, and I'd ask him to come and correct the butchering of his name. Steve? Hey. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, we want to welcome everyone here to Pasadena Presbyterian Church. Uh, I, I'm not a priest, but, uh, you know, that's all right. I'm a pastor. That'll work. Uh, and uh, we, you are all welcome here. We're happy to be a part of the community. We've been here since 1875. Yeah, and uh, we, uh, we've hopefully done some good over those years. But uh, anyway, we're, we're, we're glad you're all here. So let me offer a, a, a prayer for us as we uh, begin this meeting. O oh Lord, our creator, by your holy prophet, you taught your ancient people to seek the welfare of the cities in which they lived. So we commend our neighborhood to your care. 
Give us strength of purpose and concern for others that we may create here a community of justice and peace where your will may be done. Be with your people where they work. Make those who carry on the industries and commerce of this community be responsive to your will. And may people of all cultures and all faiths and with differing talents find with one another the fulfillment of their humanity as we work together. Bless this meeting and bless our leaders. Amen. Thank you. Um, most of you have uh, observed in the media the passing of famed filmmaker John Singleton and like the young people from Blair High School, Jun Blair High School Junior ROTC, uh, John Singleton was a graduate of Blair High School. And so I would just like to acknowledge in appropriate fashion the passing of a legendary filmmaker by the name of John Singleton who grew up in our community, whose mom still lives in this community, someone who was very active with young people in providing scholarship. So if you would, uh, I would say in your own way, in quiet contemplation, just think about the positive um, contributions that John made to Pasadena, made to the state of California, made to our country and possibly the world. At the age of 51, we lost a light in our community, John Singleton. I would also like to recognize city staff who are here. Uh, they are not required to come to community meetings, and so I feel particularly blessed that for some reason I can convince city staff to come to District 3 community meetings. So tonight, and I introduce them for the purpose of those of you who would like to have conversation with them, particularly after our formal meeting, so you'll know exactly who they are, and I just ask that you raise your hand, and that would be sufficient, I believe. So we have our city manager, Steve Mermel, our police chief, John Perez, our fire chief, Bertrand Washington, Lieutenant John Mercado, Mark Chomsky, our city clerk, who is responsible for making sure that the city of Pasadena census count, um, I can't say is accurate, but at least that we have a collaboration with the United States census representatives to do the best that we can in counting all of the residents of the city of Pasadena. Tim McDonald, the deputy director of library services for the city of Pasadena. Chris Markarian, the city engineer. Chris, we'll hear from Chris a little bit later. Catherine Haney, the library management analyst. Joaquin Siquez, principal traffic engineer. Lisa Derdarian, our public information officer. Michelle Bill Bonaris, or Bonnery, city attorney. Tiffany Tran from Public Works, our Public Works engineer. And so I don't forget them, I'd like to give now a special acknowledgement to our ambassadors, and those are the young people that greeted you on the way in and provided you a copy of the program and hopefully took your information. Taylor Grimes is lead tonight, and Casey Young, Sebastian Flores, and from our Arts and Cultural Affairs Division, hopefully Rochelle Branch is here. Uh, she is planning to come. Wendy Miller, our program coordinator too in planning and community development. Wendy, are you here yet? Uh, let's see, from Pasadena Water and Power, Renee Bowers, Events and Education Coordinator. Uh, let's see, Kathy Stokes, Administrator of Public Works. Liz Arnold, Program Coordinator, Education Volunteers for Young and Healthy. I think Young and Healthy is in the back on the right-hand side, my right. 
And let's see if I've missed anyone. Uh, I would like to acknowledge all of the Pasadena media team. You saw Malcolm up here, uh, Bobby Ferguson's here, and a whole host of others from Pasadena media. They are not required to film our community meetings, but to keep us all honest, they do that. And we would just like to give them a special round of applause for always being here on time and helping us set up. If you would, give a shout out to Pasadena Media. Um, I have a number of updates, but in the interest of time, I think we're gonna go directly to the program as it's listed. And then at the end, hopefully I can provide a meaningful updates on a lot of the projects that are taking place in the city, but specifically in District 3. So at this time, I would welcome our police chief, John Perez, and he'll introduce members of his team to give us some updates related to public safety. John? So as I begin, um, I'm going to let Lieutenant Mercado talk about the overview of crime in the area and then I will answer specific questions. But before I start, I think it's important to acknowledge as he end, ends his two-year term as the Vice Mayor, a uh, round of applause for the Vice Mayor Kennedy, please. <laughs> you know, over the years, beyond these two years, and he's been in for a term and a half in, in, in my entire career, it goes over 30 years in the city. Uh, the vice mayor has always been uh, a source of, of information, uh, guidance, um, insight, and leadership for us as a community. So we look forward to him as he ends this, this part of his uh, council member career and goes on to the rest of his term. Uh, one more piece of uh, information about Mr. Kennedy, the vice mayor, is that we should wish him a happy birthday here coming up over the weekend. Uh, so a happy birthday on three for the vice mayor. One, two, three. Happy birthday. So, I was going to try to go with a, a singing happy birthday, but I'm not, not sure how that was going to go. So, so here we are. And so as I continue forward, uh, the number one issue we have in our community day to day is our homeless challenge that we have. And as a police department, I don't talk from a perspective of trying to make arrests or trying to eliminate the fact that uh, we have homeless. What we're trying to do is conduct outreach, try to be a visible source to connect them to the services they need with an understanding there are times we do have to make arrests, there are times we have to do enforcement, but a large percentage of the time we're really trying to find a connection point and trying to get them the resources that they need. It is very difficult to do. In the coming months under the leadership of the city manager, we're very fortunate with his insight that we provided a group of uh, city personnel that were examining both the long term and the everyday impact of homeless and trying to get at it. And I think you're going to start seeing a difference going forward. So it is something that all of us have in front of our minds and our efforts, not just in terms of eliminating it, but actually getting services for people who really need it. And so we see these problems all around, right across the street. For those of you that see what's happening uh, at the church, we are trying to work with them on education and outreach and in trying to ensure that uh, we're making it best for everybody in the community. It may seem like slow steps, but a lot is going on with that, so uh, please be patient with that. Uh, what I will do at this point is give it to Lieutenant Mercado to talk about crime stats, and then I'll be here to answer any specific questions to the events that he's talking about. Sure. Thank you, Chief. Good evening, everybody. It's nice to be here. Um, I, I wanted to start by um, reassuring anyone that I am not your normal service area lieutenant. That still is, for those of you who are familiar with her. Um, Lieutenant Marsha Tagloretti. Uh, I'm filling in for her. Um, so I didn't want you to think that there was a, a big change going on and now you don't know who to get a hold of if you need help. You can always reach out to me. I work Monday through Thursday, 3 p.m. to 1 a.m. Um, and uh, Marsha Tagloretti works uh, the weekends during the day. So I wanted to rest, uh, give you some peace of mind if, if you're wondering who is this uh, person? I've never seen him before because she still is your service area lieutenant. Um, the month of April for District 3 was, was a great month. Um, year to date, uh, it, um, it continues to be, District 3 continues to be one of the leading districts in the city. Um, just to throw out some numbers, uh, this past month for April, uh, there were 53 reportable crimes. Um, 
compared to 100 or 1,112 calls for service that the community um, called and asked for us to respond to. Um, so that's a that's a great uh, a great percentage of calls that were not necessarily crimes, uh, but things that we were able to respond and help. The the leading calls, and oftentimes a lot of people say, well, 1,112 calls for service, that seems like a lot. Um, the leading calls that we've had last month were um, a category that's rather broad. It's all other offenses uh, that had 590. Those are calls where we're checking the welfare on somebody. Um, perhaps somebody needs a ride or what we call a public assist, a runaway, um, things of, of that uh, they, they generally touch more on our care for the community versus any kind of enforcement. So by, by far, the greater amount of calls for service last month in your district were those um, public service or care for the community types of calls where we went out and checked on welfares of people and, and assisted people in helping them with services rather than direct enforcement action. Uh, the second most, uh, and this will probably be no surprise for those of you who live in the area, which would be all of you, the second highest call, and that's all the way down to 190, um, were noise violations. And probably not a surprise, most of those happened on the weekends. And then the third highest call dropping down to 96 were disturbance. And that would be um, arguments that neighbors may be having, arguments that families may be having. Those sometimes lead to enforcement actions, most of the time they result in keeping the peace between the disputing parties. Um, so crime has been, has been really low in District 3, really low citywide. Um, year to date, which I found pretty, pretty encouraging, for District 3, uh, there was 19% there, of the crime that we've had in the city. 19% of that has been in District 3, which is really low. So District 3 is doing well. I would love to be able to say it's because my officers are phenomenal, which they are, but they are phenomenal because you as a community are very much engaged with what's happening in your community and you're empowering us to go out and make a difference and help things be more safe for you in your, in your environment and in your, in your neighborhood. So, so please continue to reach out to us. Please continue to call us when you, when you see something. Um, definitely say something. Give us an opportunity to make a difference for you and your neighbors as you have been. So I, I want to thank you and commend you for how you partnered with us um, and, and encourage you to continue to do the same. Thank you. And so with that really quick as I end it, uh, I'd like to, uh, Brian Wallace, can you stand for a moment, Brian, so they could... Uh, from, the, the, from the Playhouse District, you should know who he is. He's really active around the area and works with the police department to help us uh, manage the homeless issues and other issues. So you've seen him around, you should know who he is. Uh, and as I end this, I'll answer any questions. The information from Lieutenant Mercado, you should understand that we operate under a service area policing model where we have officers and sergeants and lieutenants responsible for specific districts of the city. So we try to get them to understand their neighborhood, their challenges, and their social issues to work with you so you're familiar with the officers. So you'll see more of that as we go forward. Is there any questions I could answer before we get off the stage? Uh, yes, sir. Oh, I'm sorry. There's a mic. Um... So as a, as a chief speaking, I don't know if it's a chief word, but uh, they're pretty awesome. Um, these things are really important to have these cameras. Uh, the officers enjoy having them because many times they're able to document the events that occur. Uh, they help us uh, improve performance. Our use of force has dropped over the last year over 30 percent. One of the ways we've been able to do that is providing the video from the use of from the body worn cameras for the officers to review to watch how they could improve their own performance. We are now uh, hitting a new level and evolution of body-worn cameras where in fact we're showing officers videos from everyday performance and interactions with the public to say what could you have done better and the officers are really watching these and they're educating themselves on how they could really improve their communication their investigations and their interaction, interactions with the public so we're seeing an improvement less personnel investigations uh, lower uses of use of force but that just doesn't happen because we have body-worn cameras on us it's a matter of making sure we use the content to ensure that we're watching it and taking it to the next level. So everything about the body-worn cameras has been outstanding. So, so the city has about 700 homeless people on the last count. 
And when you look at the majority of the 700, a lot of those people are looking for resources and outreach. They are looking for places for shelter. Many have children. Many just need help. And I think we're trying to get them that help in many areas. Of the 700, we probably deal with less than 100 that are chronic, that need more help, that sometimes are unable to take care of themselves, that really we try to work with more carefully. It's more challenging with, with that population group because we need cooperation from both uh, the people we encounter and the police officers to work together. So that's more challenging for us on a day-to-day -day basis. Overall, uh, we are seeing a usage of Union Station and some of the outreach centers. Uh, Shepherd's Door is doing a great job. We just need a lot more of it. We are challenged by the what I call the daytime homeless that maybe not live in Pasadena but come in on the trains and might depart at night or come in at night and depart uh, during the day. So we're challenged by those that really don't come from Pasadena, don't really care to have services. So we're trying to find a way to really manage the different sets of homeless that have different type of challenges. I think we're doing better. We're just a long way off from finding a, a firm solution to this. But it's a community effort. It's not just a police solution. It's a collaborative outreach approach from city departments, from the community, from business districts. We have to try to evolve into a place where it's holistic with all of us working together. So we're not quite there, to be honest with you. It's going to take some more time. But I think everybody's minds and their hearts are into finding solutions for this. So I think we're hitting a new level of trying to work this thing out into the future. Doing our best, uh, we receive yearly mental health training as a department, and we also try to provide training to the different roll calls and officers. We have a specialized team of officers working with clinicians that go out into the field, and those officers train many of our other officers through this type of work. We just reestablished our neighborhood bicycle unit, uh, and they, in fact, are learning how to do this as well. So with the yearly training and probably the, the uh, quarterly training the officers receive in roll call, we are getting better and more aware. Where that training is at is trying to identify the signs of, uh, of the thresholds of people's ability to cooperate with us. So there are times when it's easy to have a working relationship, and at times there's no, uh, you know, what they call de-escalation or communication methods are just not going to work. And we're really trying to figure out when we hit that barrier, what's the next level to work that out. So I think that's going to be what you see coming forward for us. We're constantly talking in rooms at the police department with outreach services trying to find new strategies. And it's a constant effort that has no end state. So we're constantly trying to get there. So thank you for that question. Thank you, Chief. Thank you, Lieutenant. Appreciate it very much. Thank you. All right. This is District 3, the best district in the whole city, because you are here. So some of you are wondering why I don't have a suit and tie on. Some of you don't care. You like the, the casual look. But I want to tell you what I was doing earlier uh, this morning. At 8 o'clock, we kicked off Habitat Humanities at 725 Manzanita. And I actually got up there, and I was actually doing part of the framing. And so that's why I look like a lumberjack. Now, Habitat for Humanity, as all of you know, has provided millions of homes around the world for families. And many of you have participated in some way to ensure that a family has a home. And so we hope in the city of Pasadena to continue to partner with Habitat Humanity. All of you know that redevelopment law was one mechanism where we could, in fact, build affordable housing. That mechanism is no longer available. It's going to take creative partnerships between city government, the private sector, nonprofit sector to continue to build affordable housing in our community, in our county, in our state, in our nation. And I'd like to applaud all of you out there who have participated in the efforts of Habitat for Humanity. And I also would like to encourage all of you to find out a little bit more about Habitat Humanity. All of you can't swing the hammer like I did this morning and be experiencing back pain. 
but many of you can give of your resources in another way, and we hope that you will consider doing that. So thank you to Habitat Humanity for convincing Susanna Porras, who is the district liaison for District 3. If you would stand, Susanna. Let everybody see you. Um, let's see. The next item on the agenda, we would like to welcome our esteemed Fire Chief Bertrand Washington, who will provide us some updates as well. Chief Washington. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Vice Mayor. Uh, if I could just start off with just a little bit of humor, I'd say that uh, I appreciate the story that he gave, and I know they out there and did, you know, did the work, but I was gonna say the truth was that I borrowed his suit, because he is always in the suit and tie, and I'm usually not. <laughs> so, all right, um, I'll keep my job and not be a comedian. <laughs> so I do wanna share with you just a little bit about what the Pasadena Fire Department's doing. Uh, we're doing a, as much as we possibly can with data. We're utilizing data to help us make decisions. Uh, some refer to it as data-driven decisions and things like that, but this is one example of a heat map of where all of our calls are in the city of Pasadena. So, and as you can see also from uh, the table on the side, uh, in 2018 we had uh, almost 15,500 and some odd calls, and uh, in, in 2019, the fiscal year, these are fiscal years, uh, we're on track for a similar call, call volume number, but we're, we're at 11,363 now. In the middle column there, under 90th, uh, that means the 90th percentile. Our goal is to be A students. So we're not measuring uh, average, the average calls uh, as some uh, agencies measure, but we're measuring what, what what does it take? Where are we at the A level? So the, for the 90th percentile, the response time is 7 minutes, 32 seconds so far this year. <clears throat> and this, this map here just kind of shows where exactly these dots uh, you know, represents where our incidents are. So as we identify where our incidents are, uh, we can allocate our resources accordingly. This is another uh, graph that we're able to look at to show us call volume by month. Uh, the entire month for the city is listed there. If you look at January, it's 1,704 incidents. And in District 3, we can see that number there would be 266. So the, the, the blue represents District 3 specifically, and the overall number for the entire city is listed there. Clearly, we can break down by district or whatever we need to do for whatever the issue is that we're trying to best address. Okay. Yeah. Well, that was that one. That was that one. It would take the fire chief to have music playing while he's up here speaking. <laughs> Oh boy, all right. <laughs> thank, thank you, Vice Mayor, again, <laughs> for the suit and the music. <laughs> so there, uh, there was a question about homelessness. Um, the fire department's been good enough to follow with what the police department is out there doing a lot with, home, with homelessness. Uh, the fire department recently partnered with the health, with the health district uh, to do something a little bit different. So through a grant, we're able to start something called the Pasadena Outreach Re Re Response Pro uh, Program. And essentially what we've done is taken one of our firefighters, we've partnered, with, uh, partnered him with staff from the, health, from the health district, and they really just go out and meet clients. They, they meet with the population, uh, they talk to them, uh, and they really develop a relationship. And so, um, and, and what their ultimate goal is, is to offer resources that the city of Pasadena has, as well as uh, that the city of Pasadena partners have throughout the county and, uh, and uh, state. 
So just to give you a little bit of an example of what they've been doing is uh, they had a target of contacting 150 people. And so far they have enrolled 72 people already in this program that we just started about uh, five months ago. So it's really, really good. They're already about halfway toward their goal. We've also seen uh, that recently they brought six individuals uh, off the streets. And again, this isn't just work where someone says, uh, I'd like to be housed. This is development of relationships, working over time, taking them to doctor's appointments. I mean, this is a very methodical pro uh, you know, process. And what we find is when we develop that uh, you know, relationship, uh, they're, they're more trusting to accept some of the resources uh, that we have available for them. So this has been a very su successful pro pro uh, program so far, and we're looking at ways uh, that we can just keep doing what they're doing and expand as much as we possibly can. So uh, kind of last here, I want to, you know, I want to, I'm going to, I'm going to wrap up with our mass notification system. Um, is there anyone here that signed up through our mass notification system, also known as PLEASE, the Pasadena Local Emergency Alert System? Well, if you are not, I would ask that you please, please go back and if you even want to just Google uh, please, P-L-E-A-S, or you go to the City of Pasadena website, you can go to the fire page, and you'll see uh, that red button there, Pasadena Local Emergency Alert System. If you click on that button, it will allow you to sign up where if something were to happen in our city, uh, a major brush fire, something that will require some type of e e evacuation, or maybe there's just some information that we want to get out to you, you can sign up through this system, choose how you want us to notify you, and choose what you want us to notify you for. Obviously, uh, the city uh, looks at your information very seriously. It would not be shared. But uh, here's just the other pages that you're going to see as you click through. So you'll just keep clicking on the red button. You want to follow the buttons that say please. You'll go to a registration portal. Uh, you'll have an opportunity to click on that to sign up and set up a new account. Uh, you'll go to a page where it's going to ask for your name, security questions, uh, uh, your uh, email address, uh, just those things which would allow you to set up an account. And then that's pretty much it. You know, to ask you, do you want a text message? Do you want a phone call? Uh, how do you want us to get a hold of you? So these are some of the things that we're working on. Uh, we can't do it without our city manager and our elected officials. Uh, our vice mayor is, you know, has done an outstanding job, and we're uh, very happy to, to, you know, I need him to look at the screen, though. Uh, he's done an outstanding job. <laughs> we're very thankful for his service as vice as vice mayor, and uh, and thank you for always giving us an opportunity to share with the public. Thank you. Uh, right. Don't go anywhere. Hopefully, there are some difficult questions for our fire chief. How about a couple questions for our fire chief? Any questions for our fire chief? Young lady in the rear. Yes. Well. First of all, I'd just like to say, and just to repeat the question, you know, what are we doing uh, given the potential for a very bad wildfire season? Uh, first of all, Pasadena has a long history of doing a lot of good work as it relates to brush clearance. And a lot of that is because of the work that each and every one of you do, especially those of you that live in the high hazard or very high hazard se se severity zone. And so that is, that is really the primary work is that the residents and the business owners, property owners are clearing brush uh, in those areas. But to enhance that, one, we're coming and we're providing free in, in uh, inspections. So in these area, uh, very high hazard zones, we're coming, we're doing an, an inspection, we're getting to know you, we're getting to talk to you more, uh, just in really making sure that you understand what we're looking for. And, uh, and if you pass the inspection, then we're off and we're on our way. We're out there right now. Uh, if we need to come back a second time or a third time, uh, those are times where then we assess a fee. And so, but that again helps to make sure that area is very, very safe. Uh, there's also some things that we're doing and I don't wanna get too far ahead of it, but uh, we recently applied for a grant. 
And I have an initial re re uh, response that I just received today uh, that it looks like we're gonna get that grant. And what that's gonna allow us to do is to tap into the youth uh, in, in and around our city to come and not only learn skills, but also to help us uh, uh, clear brush around areas where uh, there's not really a requirement to clear brush for, uh, for us, but it's still areas that we're con con concerned about. So we'll have them working for the summer and it'll be grant funded. And uh, I'm really close to being able to say that that's gonna happen. So that's just uh, some examples of what we're uh, doing. Yes. Sure. Uh, so the name for short is Port Pasadena Outreach Re Re uh, Response Team. And um, if you call either my office or the uh, public health department, uh, you know, we can give you all the information about it. You can find us on the web you know, your website, of course, or just dial the city main number ask for fire department and, and we'll get to you. Thanks, sir. Thank you very much. Let's give a round of applause to our fire chief. Um, I assure you, unlike someone in national office, there is not a personality cult. I did not ask them to do that, I promise you. I did not ask that. I was surprised as you were. Uh, I guess that's in reference to my birthday, maybe. So at this time, I would like to introduce someone who is a extraordinary um, public servant in one context, but an employee in another context of the city of Pasadena, one of our three, really four, charter officers. And our charter officers, as you know, the city manager, Steve Mermel, Mark Chomsky as our city clerk, and then Michelle Bonarice, who actually at this point is operating as our city prosecutor and our city attorney. And when we have professionals like who they are, I'd like them occasionally to come and share their thoughts about what they're doing to make our city safe and what they do in their day job so you'll have a better understanding of their responsibilities. Having said that, the City Council also has included in their performance evaluations their visits to our community meetings. Michelle Bunneries, please welcome. Please welcome her to the podium. Now, I better not do that. I just better stop. Michelle. <laughs> Thank you so much, Vice Mayor. Well, good evening. It's good to see all of you this evening. Uh, it is quite an honor to work with our city council and our soon-to-be outgoing vice mayor, John Kennedy, who has done a fine job representing District 3. As the city attorney and city prosecutor, I'm responsible for all legal matters involving the city as an, a municipal entity. So that's civil, meaning lawsuits, drafting ordinances, contracts, et cetera, as well as criminal, where we process nearly 5,000 cases that are misdemeanors. We don't handle felonies. That's something that the district attorney's office does. But for misdemeanor and infraction matters, our office is responsible for those crimes that occur within the city of Pasadena. And in looking at restorative justice and reintegration into our community, our office has partnered with different organizations in the region to try to help people become effectively reintegrated into our community so our communities will be safer. So that, of course, includes District 3. And some of those organizations, we have kind of four that are going right now that target different levels of offenders. And it would range from the Flint Ridge Center, which addresses offenders who are repeat offenders. They're known as recidivists, but repeat offenders. And uh, Foothill Family Services, which targets youthful offenders ages 18 to 25. And uh, D.D. Hirsch, which targets uh, or addresses women who 
are having addiction issues, and Shepherd's Door, which deals with domestic violence offenders. And what happens with those programs is we still prosecute, and in appropriate situations, not all situations, someone may be appropriately referred to one of these organizations, and they are teamed with resources. So if it's a drug addiction issue, they would be teamed with a resource provider that would assist them with that. If it's uh, mental health issues or other issues, there are professionals that we team with through those organizations to work with those individuals. And if they are successful in going through those programs, then they can come back and either get their case uh, dismissed or um, reduced based on the, the circumstances. So that's an effort that we have uh, targeted to assist in ensuring that our communities are safe and also help people improve themselves because they've often been caught in circumstances and they want to get out of that. So it's designed as a way to help uh, with many of those issues. And in terms of community enhancement, the CRASH program, which many of you may have heard of, is something that has been around the city for a while. It stands for Community Resources Against Substandard Housing. And we team with other departments within the city and other agencies uh, that are beyond the city of Pasadena, uh, such as Animal Control. They're within the city, but we work with them to uh, provide protection and enhanced properties in the city. So often there is a problem property and sometimes you may think it's taking a long time to get it together. But people have civil rights, they have due process rights, they have property ownership rights, and so we have to balance that with the needs and the interest of the community, of the neighbors, and of ensuring a safe community. We have uh, worked this year to try to enhance that, to expand it, to focus on multifamily housing projects that uh, tend to have problems and have a focus on those areas. Uh, one last thing I'll touch on briefly is domestic violence prevention and recognition. In our communities, we all can have a part in that, even if we are not personally a victim or an offender, we may see signs of that in others. So we would ask that you encourage those who you believe are, are potential victims of domestic violence to seek out resources. We have Peace Over Violence in Pasadena, we have Shepherd's Door in Pasadena, and we have our office, which we don't provide the resource of counseling or referral. We can refer them to an organization. Um, they can always go to the police department. Some people are fearful of that, but that's another resource. And the police department has staff designed to help the victims, they are both men and women, work through their circumstances. So I would encourage you to be active in your communities, to keep your eyes open, your ears open, and work with us as you deem appropriate. If you have questions, we're available, I'm available. Uh, you see me every Monday night sitting a couple of seats from the vice mayor. Uh, so I'm there for you and I appreciate your attendance this evening and I wish you a good evening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Malcolm. Okay. Now I would like to ask that all of the commissioner, board members, and committee members that have received an appointment from the city council, if you would please stand. And the purpose for having you stand is for those members in the audience who don't know you, they will get to know you and maybe they have questions when you stick around after the meeting. So if you're an appointee, would you please stand? So you have Mark, you have um, Michael Warner with Sister Cities. You have Archie Purvis with the Pasadena Center Operating Company. You have Maury Wolfson, who's uh, Environmental Advisory Commission. You have Bob Altman in the front seat. Uh, Pasadena Media, is there, oh. You also have 
Recreation and Parks Commissioner, Treasurer Shepard, and I think we've covered most of our committee members, commissioners, and board members. Thank you all for your service, and I hope that our residents will have questions for you. Uh, the next item on the agenda, moving quickly, is uh, Playhouse District Association PDA featured events and future projects, and I'd invite the Executive Director Brian Wallace and Chris Makarian, our city and engineer, to come forward. Let me say this as you come forward, that we as a community must think of ourselves as a community, and that's one Pasadena, and that is enjoying what happens north of the freeway and enjoying what happens south of the freeway and breaching the continental divide that is the 210 freeway. And we do that by recognizing how beautiful Robinson Park is, Jackie Robinson Center, the new park that's coming on board in a year and a half or two at El Molino and Union, and really getting to know your neighbors, really getting up to the Northwest and seeing what's going on. We are having our meeting here tonight because I want to make sure that people feel like they're integrated, integrated in the context of one community, neighbor looking out, out for neighbor. And what I'm saying is just empty words unless you are willing to take a step and get out of your comfort zone and walk. Walk to the Northwest. Take a risk. I take a risk when I walk to the south of the freeway. <laughs> hey, let's get in this together and really build that one Pasadena where we're all walking, getting out of our cars, and really experiencing the beauty of Pasadena. Not to be on the soapbox too long, but in, on my street where I grew up on Hammond Street, between Lincoln and Forrest, I had never seen a duck in ducklets, or whatever you call those baby ducks, walking on, in my neighborhood. And so my assumption is, rightly or wrongly, is that they were on their way to the Rose Bowl where you see geese. Um, but that was an extraordinary sight just to look up and, and see that. So there are a lot of things that we need to kind of take our heads kind of buried into our own daily lives and see what else is going on in Pasadena. And what's true for south of the freeway is certainly true for north of the freeway in terms of enjoying the Lemley, enjoying the Playhouse District, and all that our rich city has to offer. And so with that, again, I'd like to welcome Brian Wallace, the Executive Director of the Pasadena District Association, and Chris Markarian, our extraordinary city engineer. Welcome. Hi, well, thanks, thanks again, Vice Mayor, for having us. And welcome to the Playhouse District. Probably uh, many of you realize you're, uh, you're sitting in the middle of it. Uh, for those of you who don't know much about it, it's actually 32 blocks of the city. It goes from Los Robles on the west, up just north of Walnut, all the way over to Catalina and Mentor over there, and then down to Green. So uh, we get the uh, joy or the pleasure of sharing the district with three uh, council districts. But of course, the biggest and the best part is here in District 3. That's right. Uh, and so, you know, a lot of the favorite places that you go probably are actually here. So Lemley, Vromans, Target, the church, of course, that we're in, Fuller Seminary, New School of Cooking, a lot of the residential development on Walnut, that's all here in District 3. So it is a great part of the city. It's a great part of uh, the council district. Uh, and together, that's uh, exactly right. It, it all makes up a, a, a great place. Um, the Playhouse District Association, for those of you who don't know, I won't bore us too much, but we're a nonprofit. The property owners in those 32 blocks fund us to provide services above and beyond what the city does. Uh, any of you guys probably seen our ambassador guides out there in their teal shirts and their hats? So that's one of the biggest kind of visible signs of, of who we are as a district. Those folks are out there every day, seven days a week. Uh, they're 
they're cleaning up uh, things you don't want to know about. Uh, there's things that you don't see, so the district looks really nice. Uh, they're also out there dealing with, I, a lot of people talking about homelessness tonight, they deal with that on a daily basis, working really closely with service providers to really make those contacts and do that outreach so that then when those service providers come in, we can kind of arm them with better information about those folks. So they do a lot of work. Uh, and really a good job of theirs is to be hospitality agents for us. That's a lot of people's only experience that they're in the Playhouse District is they might see one of our guides and they might have to ask them a question. So next time you see uh, one of them, uh, ask them something and you might learn something new. They might refer to a new business or, or answer a question that you maybe didn't even know about it. Um, some other things that we do, uh, probably a lot of you recognize some of the crosswalk art that is around the district. We've done those. Uh, the utility box art. There's a lot of postcards in the back. Please take as many as you can. Those are kind of hot commodities. Uh, we get calls from around the country about how did you guys do those and your Department of Transportation let you do what? You know, and I say the Pasadena is great. So um, there's a really a lot of innovative things that we get to do. Um, so, th so that's exciting. One of the things we did last year was we started a mural program program. So if you're looking at behind Lemley, across from the New Andalusia, you'll see the first of those, and then there's two more in the, uh, the Madison parking lot uh, behind Jacob Marsh there. So we really try to build this notion of an arts and culture district here in the city, uh, and I hope that starts to resonate uh, with you and the residents. Uh, probably the biggest uh, other thing that we do that you recognize is a lot of our events. We just had our fifth uh, annual wine walk. Thanks to Mr. Bob Oldman for giving us that idea a few years ago. Sell out crowd every year, really cool event. Coming up in a few weeks is the block party. We partner with the Playhouse on that. Uh, last year we did that, drew 12,000 people. Um, hopefully the police department doesn't make us hire too many more officers this year. We have a very ruly crowd, by the way. Uh, it's music, food, art, uh, entertainment. Uh, it's a really great time to showcase all of what's uh, great in the Playhouse District and the city. And this year we've got regional folks uh, from the Huntington Library coming, uh, Peterson Automotive Museum, uh, the LA Zoo, and the Aquarium in the Pacific. So it's really getting a lot of good regional draw and really the point of these big events, yes they're fun and tiring days for us, but they're really exposed to the Playhouse District in this part of Pasadena to other folks who may not know it exists. So they come in for an event and then they get to spend their time here and then hopefully come back and spend their money here. Uh, some other things we have going on, uh, right after that we take about a week off, believe it or not, and then we start our summer jazz concerts. Uh, the 16th year we're doing those uh, on the stage behind Romans there. Uh, those are free every Sunday night starting on Father's Day, five to seven, they're free, first come, first serve, we put chairs out. It's usually shady, it will be hot, it's summer in Pasadena, but it's a really great evening and you get to spend the night uh, there and, and go have uh, dinner or pop into Lemley for, uh, uh, for, to cool down for a movie. Uh, we're going to be doing an event on Mentor later this year, really kind of helping that area grow, the Ice House and Boston Court over there. That's kind of the, the forgotten part of the Playhouse District. We often say, yes, we are the Playhouse, but we're a lot more than just the Playhouse as well. Again, those 32 blocks, trying to do that. And then no event, right, Margie, can be uh, any bigger than Art Walk that we do on October 12th. And that'll be on Green Street again this year. Uh, again, we have 75 artists that'll come, booths, music, activities. Uh, it's a great event following Art Night, of course, that the city does. Um, one of the things I want to talk about tonight, and then I'm going to kind of turn it over to Chris to talk about an exciting project, is our High Neighbor Program. I talked about this with a few of you when you came in. On the table back there, I've got some uh, lovely purple tote bags if you sign up tonight. Uh, it's a free program and it's really, uh, you know, speaking of what the Vice Mayor was just saying about building community, uh, we call it High Neighbor because yes, there's a lot of new residential growth happening in the district, but there's also a lot of folks that live and work here and this is really their neighborhood, right? It's not just a business district, it's not just where people live, but it's really where you do all of that. So we really try to promote uh, spending your time, spending your money, spending your um, uh, your, your energy here in the district. So uh, you sign up for High Neighbor, we have great tote, tote bags and you can show your district pride. Uh, so lastly, uh, one of the other things that we do, and, and I want to recognize one of our board members here, Margie, uh, who is a is District 3 resident and a property owner here in, uh, in a condominium. Uh, the, the board uh, has been working for a number of years, the board of the Playhouse District Association on how do we get a park here and how do we balance the needs for parking, right? It's been a long time, 20 year dialogue and that's a pleasant word for it. 
But fortunately, over the last year and a half, we've really, I think, developed a pretty um, solid compromise uh, uh, solution here that uh, Chris is going to talk about from the city standpoint. Uh, and I think thanks a lot to the uh, vice mayor's support for uh, really uh, spearheading the, the leadership and with city staff to get that uh, project finally moving. And we're excited that uh, we will now, as, as a vice mayor reference at Union and El Molino, be taking part of that parking lot uh, along with the bank, bank site next door uh, and, and providing both parking and a park there in, in some form. And uh, Chris is going to talk to us now about kind of what that process looks like and how we can all engage and roll up our sleeves. And we know this is Pasadena, so this will not happen overnight, but it'll be quicker than the next 20 years, right? Okay. And I'm around for questions if we need them uh, later. You have my word on that. That's it. Yeah. You have my word on that. Good evening, everyone. And thank you, Vice Mayor, for having me today and this opportunity. Uh, I'm with the Public Works Department, primarily Engineering Division, and our group basically delivers all of our capital projects for the city. So we do the design and construction, uh, including all the street improvements, bridges, and of course, parks. And tonight, I want to highlight to you uh, a new park that's proposed, uh, as Brian mentioned, 20 years in the making. Um, however, what I'd like to do here is kind of highlight some of the key decisions that our, uh, our council, along with staff support, uh, brought this uh, park to a viable uh, present stage and uh, have passed the baton on to us, engineering, to start the planning, design, and of course the construction process. So uh, just highlighting some of the key decisions over the last 18 months. Uh, back about a year and a half ago in October, council uh, had directed our staff to gather some community input and look into uh, our city-owned parking lot at Union and El Molino for a possible park space because uh, this area around within the central district was identified as underserved. And at the same time, a uh, few months after, in January, the Banner Bank site became available, and it was a good opportunity uh, for council to approve the purchase of that site. It's uh, located next to the uh, Union El Molino parking lot. Uh, here you see on the map, the Banner Bank is on the corner of Union and Oak Knoll. And uh, just below that, sorry, uh, the city also owns a small sliver of lot there in the green, I don't know if you could see that, along with the parking lot. So in looking into viable options for us, and we uh, held a community meeting last February, perhaps some of you were there, and uh, we found that most of the attendees were demonstrating the desire for a park space and in support of the Banner Bank parcel for the use of that park. And majority also favored using a portion of the parking lot f towards uh, seeing that park come to fruition as a neighborhood park and to be able to meet all of the programming uh, needs of the community. Um, alongside that, to make that happen, uh, just recently back in February, the city was able to transfer some of the parking space needs that the Lamley Theater was entitled to in that parking lot to another location. So this brought about the opportunity for us to uh, merge portion of the Banner Bank site with I'm sorry, to merge the Banner Bank site with a portion of the city's own parking lot. And back in March 11, just recently, council appropriated two and a half million dollars of residential impact fees to be able to transfer that property from park, parking use to park use for development of the park. So that brings us to today and the next steps that um, we will be heading up. Uh, tonight I have also some of our engineers, Hayden Melbourne, who will be coming up here, and Tiffany Tran are here, both, who are part of the team that 
manage this project. Uh, we will be continuing our community engagement process, and that is why I'm here. I'd love to meet you all and be able to get to know the community, the key stakeholders, uh, provide uh, some uh, feedback for us to partake in the planning and development process of this new park. Uh, we will be establishing a steering committee to help us do that, along with holding several community meetings in the coming months. Um, we're hoping that within a, uh, by the end of June next year, we will have the design completed and ready f to go out to bid for construction. So here I've highlighted some of our anticipated schedule uh, as to first being able to put together a design team of consultants, bringing together landscape architects and engineers alongside with uh, making sure we have a full funding to move forward. We're anticipating to uh, acquire that with our next fiscal year's budget. And uh, come July, we'll be ready for the public outreach process and being able to uh, reach out to you and collaborate closely with the community, not just around, but as a whole, to uh, come up with a conceptual design, figure out what kind of programming, what kind of amenities we're looking for, uh, and the layout of the park. Uh, something to maximize the use by our, both our residents and the business owners, really. So um, we're hoping that by the end of this year, December, we will have that de conceptual design concept and a consensus with the community completed. Once we have that, and it kind of forms the map of what we're now going to be doing as far as putting construction documents together, plans and specifications, and um, we should also have a better idea of how much it would cost. So uh, obviously based on the amenities and the footprint and some of the improvements needed, that would give us a more um, a realistic idea of what the cost would be. And uh, in having that in hand, we would likely the following fiscal year, so we're looking at almost a year and a half out, we would be ready for construction um, once the funds are appropriated. Currently, what we are, have appropriated is money for design, and we'll be moving forward with that. So we're here tonight. I'm happy to um, uh, answer any questions at the end of uh, this evening. Uh, given this opportunity to come here tonight, Vice Mayor, if I may, I want to use this opportunity to plug another one of our projects that we're working on. So I'd like to ask Hayden Melbourne, who's the principal engineer, he, he and his team uh, recently completed the Robinson Park Recreation Center. And yes. And uh, he'll be talking about the next phase of work that we'll be doing at the Robinson Park. Be quick. I'll be quick. <laughs> All right. Vice Mayor Kennedy, I want to thank you. Um, I'm excited to talk about the, uh, oh, is that a little better? All right, there we go, okay. Uh, I want to thank uh, Vice Mayor Kennedy for having me this evening. I'm very excited to talk about the third phase of the Robinson Park Recreation Center um, renovation. Uh, this, the last phase of the, the Robinson Park renovation will be for the uh, replacement of the pool building and the pools in, in its entirety. Now, I'm here this evening to um, reach out to you, the community, because before we go into design, I want to know what it is you guys are looking for, whether it's programming, uh, certain amenities there at the facilities. And so I wanted to let you guys know that over the next two months, we have four community meetings scheduled um, at Northwest Commission. Also, uh, we're gonna be setting up tables at the community center itself. So some of you can't make the evening meetings, but we'll be there during the day. Um, and also we're gonna be going to Rec and Parks Commission. Um, this project is, can't happen without you. So we look forward to seeing everybody there um, and getting all of your input. Um, Tiffany Tran, my engineer in the back, uh, she has comment cards, so if you can't make it to the other meetings, um, I would just like to uh, have you go back there, write your name, any ideas that you may have for the project, we'd really appreciate it. So thank you very much, and have a good evening.
appreciate it. Um, you know, we have extraordinary assets in District 3, and one of those assets that I continually share is Pacific Oaks um, College. And at Pacific Oaks, there is a gentleman who is in contention to become the next president of Pacific Oaks, and his name is Jack Padunton. And Jack is here, and we're just grateful that you would come out and be a part of the meeting tonight. So please give applause to Jack, who's the acting president of Pacific Oaks College. Um, at this time, I would like to introduce Joaquin Siquez, who is the principal traffic engineer, and he's going to be talking to us briefly about Union Street protected bike lane. And then after we hear from Joaquin, we will have a brief pre presentation on the census 2020 uh, count, its overview and closing remarks, and then a closing affirmative uplifting uh, prayer by uh, Dr. William Turner Jr. So please welcome Joaquin. Thank you again, Vice Mayor, and thank you all for being here tonight. Uh, again, my name is Joaquin Sikas. I am the Principal Traffic Engineer in the Transportation Department for Pasadena. And tonight I really just wanted to give you a brief overview on the Uni Union Street Protected Bike Lane Project and invite you to a workshop that we're having tomorrow, um, Thursday, May 2nd, at City Hall to discuss the design details of this project and really get a lot of community feedback. The Union Street Protected Bike Lane is a two-way bike lane on Union Street separated from moving traffic by parked vehicles or uh, islands or other barriers. The image on the left is what Union Street looks like now. It's uh, three through lanes uh, plus a left turn lane and a right turn lane. Uh, this project will allow us to put in a two-way protected bike lane uh, while keeping um, the capacity of two through lanes and the left turn and right turn lane and really enhancing the safety there for pedestrians and bicyclists and motorists using that area. The project location itself is on Union Street between Arroyo Parkway and Hill Avenue. And this includes uh, modifying 14 traffic signals to provide um, control for that protected bike lane. So there's specific bicycle signals that will be installed. In addition, we'll be installing four new traffic signals on the east side of Union Street uh, between Hill and Wilson, those four intersections that currently do not have traffic signals. Uh, as part of an extension of this Union Street protected bike lane, we're also including the addition of two new traffic signals at Colorado Boulevard and Holliston and Green Street at Holliston to be able to uh, allow the bicycle traffic to then travel uh, down Holliston to Cordova, which is currently a, um, uh, a bike lane there on Cordova East and West. Uh, real quickly, the, the project timeline for this project, uh, we've uh, been in the design phase uh, for about a year now, or about a year and a half now. Um, last year, we had our first um, a design workshop, which was really a meeting to reintroduce the project um, and get community input. Uh, from that meeting, we took all of the input we had at a really well-attended meeting um, and worked on the design, and we're currently at 60% design. And the meeting tomorrow will be to present the design, um, talk about all the, the input that we received. Um, we had a meeting in March with the Playhouse District Association, Economic Development and Transportation Committee to talk about some of the concerns there uh, with parking and loading. Um, and all of that's been incorporated into the 60% design. Um, following that, we will move on to our 90% design um, component and have that completed by the end of 20, 2019. Uh, from there until construction, it'll be about one year. Uh, a lot of that is the, um, the, the design review process through Caltrans and then the time needed to advertise for construction and bring a contractor on board. Um, so again, real quickly, I just want to invite you all to the, uh, the training, I'm sorry, the training room down in Pasadena City Hall uh, at 100 North Garfield. It's the big building, you know, in the middle of the city um, there. So uh, love to see you all there. As Vice Mayor Kennedy alluded to before, really the success of these projects is based on the community input and, and the feedback that we get from the community. So uh, this project, the park projects, um, it, it all revolves uh, 
uh, around us being able to get input from the, the residents that are there, the businesses, um, and, uh, and everybody who uses the facility. So we hope to see you there tomorrow evening, and that's, that's all I got. Thanks, Vice Mayor. Thank you, Juan. Please give a round of applause to Juan. Thank you for that presentation. Uh, I was remiss in not introducing Tina Rios. Tina, are you still here? Tina, why don't you come up front so everyone can see you? Tina is an intern in District 3's office, and she really is a joy to work with. So in one of our team meetings, from time to time, we have three to seven interns in our office. Uh, we have team meetings to discuss how to better service the issues and needs of District 3. So one meeting I came to, and I wasn't feeling well because of the pollen. And so Tina recognized that, and being a part of the indigenous community, historically, ancestrally, from this area and other Native Americans, but indigenous people from this part of the world, uh, she recognized that maybe if she were to obtain locally produced honey, actually in District 3, and provide that to me, that maybe it would cut down on the allergy or the allergic reactions I was having. So she brought that to one of our other meetings, and I took a tablespoon of the locally produced honey, and it actually reduced my uh, allergies. So uh, make sure that you see Tina if you live in District 3 and you want locally produced honey. Thank you, Tina. Oh. And she just informs me the terminology is path. To freedom is the uh, source for the honey locally in District 3. Path to freedom locally produced yes. honey. In District 3. Rah, rah, District 3 always tops. Okay, the next presentation that we have tonight is from Michael Curry, who is the Partnership Specialist 2020 for the United States Census Count. So, Michael, would you please come forward and have a brief presentation? There may be questions for you to ensure that there is an adequate count. Thank you. Thank you. Good, e good evening, everyone. Just want to introduce myself. I'm Jesse Gonzalez, also Partnership Specialist with the U.S. Census Bureau. And uh, thank you, Vice Mayor, for having us here. Sorry, guys. Uh, I was trying to play a video. Uh, my name is Michael Corey, and this is my colleague, uh, Jesse Gonzalez. Uh, we're Partnership Specialist uh, with the Census Bureau. Uh, our program is a Community Partnership and Engagement Program. Um, we'll be presenting after a um, quick video about the census. As mandated by the U.S. Constitution, America gets one chance each decade to count its population. The census is the foundation of our representative democracy. The next census in 2020 will measure a growing and diverse nation. An undertaking like this requires years of research and testing to ensure an accurate and complete count. That's why planning is already underway to make the next census the most efficient, advanced, and effective in history. Through its ongoing research and testing, the Census Bureau has identified four key areas in which investing now will save taxpayers money later in 2020, all without sacrificing quality or accuracy. First, past censuses have required the Census Bureau to walk literally every street in every neighborhood to note every housing unit before Census Day. Now, the Census Bureau is using the Postal Service, aerial imagery, and other sources to base its work on maps and addresses that reflect the absolute latest changes to communities. Second, by using information the public has already provided the government, the Census Bureau plans to further reduce the number of residence visits. For instance, 
reviewing administrative records will provide the data needed in cases where people do not respond, while at the same time identify vacant housing units that otherwise would be visited by a census taker. Utilizing information like this has the potential to save up to $1.4 billion. Third, the Census Bureau is making responding more convenient by offering secure online, phone, or mail options. This will reduce the number of follow-up door-to-door interviews, the most expensive part of any census, saving an estimated $400 million in taxpayer funds. By taking advantage of the rapid changes in technology since the last census, the agency will improve how it conducts and governs operations. For example, digitally transmitting daily staff assignments and case updates will streamline on-the-ground operations and reporting structures, saving up to $2.5 billion. Finally, the 2020 Census will provide a new benchmark for all future censuses. By investing now, the nation will save billions in taxpayer dollars later and ensure a quick, easy, and safe count for every person across the United States. Uh, thank you, Vice Mayor, for inviting us tonight. Uh, we're excited to be here today um, to talk about the census, the upcoming census, and why the, I'm going to start with the questions, why the census is important to you. Uh, the census uh, determines where up to $675 billion um, to be distributed to the states. And based on George Washington University survey, um, the, there's, California receives $115 billion based on the census number, and uh, 60, uh, $76 billion uh, goes to the top 22 programs, such as Medicaid, Medicare, Section 8 housing, SNAP, and so on. Uh, basically it comes down to $2,000 per capita. So we need to get the best count to get this money back to the community. So what, that's why we're here to educate the people about the importance of the census uh, because we can bring this, this money back to the communities uh, or all specifically for this kind of program which is, uh, includes um, uh, programs such as the crime prevention where it's uh, the previous presentation we are talking about and that's part of the census number. Why does the Census Bureau need your help? Uh, the census is a massive, uh, Census 2020 is a massive and complex uh, endeavor. So the census cannot do it alone. Uh, it's required everybody uh, from the community just to participate to help the census out. We're here to help you out, to collaborate with every single uh, part of the community. And that's our job, which is with the Community Partnership and Engagement Program. Um, so we, we do the outreach for everybody to uh, educate them to about the importance of the census. However, again, we cannot do it alone. Uh, for example, this is District 3, uh, where it shows some areas where the darker colors, that's where the neighborhoods were uh, least likely to respond. And that's why we ask everybody to participate and help us out, uh, where they can inform the uh, community members about the importance of the census. How can you help? Uh, you can generate the community awareness and readiness for the 2020 census, increase the awareness and motivate residents to respond to the 2020 census, continue inviting us to this kind of events, uh, which is we, um, we can uh, be like all over uh, Pasadena and other areas with, where events where do the outreach for people. So um, it's important to um, have us in the events so we can do the outreach and help out the community and the city especially. Uh, we're co collaborating with the city of Pasadena which is doing an, uh, an amazing job uh, trying to get the best count possible uh, so we can help the community out uh, uh, with the best count and most accurate count. So this map is from 2010. So we're here today. So we work on the 2020. So this is from 2010, that's 10 years ago. So we can clear this map and we start over and we can bring more money and uh, uh, get more, the community more involved in the census and that's our job here to help you out with it. And also, um, we need your help for fulfilling a lot of jobs for the census. Um, so if you can help us out, there's a lot of uh, positions will be open. There's gonna be an area census office in Pasadena. 
uh, where you can apply and there's gonna a lot of jobs involved there. This, this office will be open in the summertime. And uh, so please, if you're interested in any job, uh, part-time, full-time, uh, there's different positions uh, from admin, uh, IT, management, supervisory, uh, numerators, uh, there's a, a lot of positions. Uh, briefly, uh, we're starting our first operation, address canvassing, this summer, starting in August, employing over 300 uh, local folks. So per ACO at the uh, Area Census Office, we will have those positions available. Uh, who else can help? Uh, Community-based organizations, nonprofits, social service providers, foundation, businesses, media, faith-based organization, and health organization. There's so many more, and we're trying to reach out to all of them. So with their help, we can actually uh, uh, raise the awareness of the community to respond to get the best count possible for the 2020. And this is a very exciting time for our nation. Uh, because of the 2020 census, uh, it it's impacts the whole nation positively uh, if we can get the best count positive. Uh, positive. So, uh, also, these, these are the trusted voices in the community. That's why we ask for that helping hand, just so you could help us raise that awareness in the community about the importance of the uh, 2020 census and the funding that comes along with it as well. This is the a flyer about how to uh, go about applying for jobs. Uh, you can grab one. There's a, I left some at the table, the white table at the uh, far left. So please uh, uh, go ahead and you can check the uh, online jobs or if you're not sure uh, which uh, position is fit for you, you can call the hotline and you'll be able to help you out with it. So let's get everybody counted. Uh, thank you. We can take a couple of questions. Uh, this is very important for our community. Mr. Warner. If someone is drawing Social Security or federal retirement, does working for you get affected retirement? Uh, no. Everybody can apply. Questions? Uh, I'm sorry. What's do, the, do we need I'm, money? I'm sorry, we didn't hear the. Yeah. Okay. You so uh, we are working closely with the service providers, and uh, as we approach the uh, kickoff, which would be April 1st, uh, we will be out in the community counting the, the homeless residents. It's a four. Uh, a approximately three to four night evening operation, and we uh, target them at night because that's uh, less likely to be mobile, and uh, we just really want to count everybody once, only once, and in the right place. So, so we're so, sorry, we're, just, we're, we're trying to reach out to all the uh, service-based uh, organizations, and uh, we're starting now, so by the time we get to April 1st next year, uh, we just, uh, th those organizations will be on board with us with the full, uh, full force operation. The, the, for the languages, the census will be available in 13 different languages. Uh, the people can respond on, uh, uh, by sending out the uh, mail format, for, uh, form online or over the phone. There's 13 different languages and there's supportive, materi supportive material for other 59 languages. Does that answer your question? Is, we heard parts of the question, but I know it's, that's good? Okay. okay. All right. Thank Any you very much. Thank you. Give Thank them you. a round of applause, please. Thank you. Um, I just would like to um, encourage all of the residents of District 3 who are here to encourage their family and friends to come to the meeting to make suggestions on how we can improve the dissemination of information to our residents, friends, business owners. I must say that in terms of the seven districts in the city of Pasadena, our district spends probably the most, or at least in the top three, in mail to make sure that those of our residents who do not have 
uh, access to the internet or who are somehow impacted by the technology divide still are able to participate in all of the activities. And so with that spending, I'm hoping that more of our residents will become involved in our community meetings, uh, really share, and if the, for some reason you feel like in coming to the meetings, your voice is not being heard, I'd like the opportunity to hear from you personally, or if you are aware of any of your colleagues, uh, fellow residents, business owners, or those who visit District 3, and they have similar concerns or any of those types of concerns, I would like to hear from you. I'd like to work with you in a collaborative fashion in figuring out how to address your issues, the issues that are the meat and potato issues, if you will, where the rubber meets the road. Because any council member is not worth their salt, not worth their weight, if they're not responding to the needs of the folks who put them in office. And so I want to hear what your concerns are and make sure that they're being appropriately addressed. Now, in terms of quick announcements, I would like to share with all of you that there are upcoming commission vacancies as of June 30, 2019. One is an opportunity for one of you or your friends or colleagues to serve on Human Relations Commission. Um, and Mr. Jones has served that commission well. He is probably one of the youngest commissioners, Justin Jones, in the city, and he rose to be chair of that committee or commission. And then our library commissioner, Sharon Calkin, is not eligible to stand again for reappointment. So that commission is available. And then most of you know uh, Bob Altman, who's here in the front row, is also terming out in terms of the Pasadena Community Access Corporation, which is our Pasadena Media. So there are three opportunities for residents in District 3 to serve and provide leadership that I certainly listen to uh, in terms of educating me to the real issues that are affecting our community. And so I'd hope you would be encouraged to apply for one of those uh, positions. If I may, I know the hour is late, I'd like to just quickly roll through some uh, announcements related to the ongoings and going-ons in uh, District 3. So I will go very quickly because of the hour we like to keep our community meetings to about an hour and a half. We started about 15 minutes late today um, because of technical difficulties. And so if you would indulge me, I'd like to hopefully share some important information. As we end tonight, folks have come out to disseminate meaningful information to District 3 and their tables are in the back. And I'd hope you would stop by out of courtesy but also out of a need to share that information with your um, members of our community, your neighbors, our neighbors. And I think it's important that we make a special effort to provide uh, information that's going to help build community. So all of you are aware that the largest real estate development project is happening. It's called Lincoln Properties. And they recently broke ground. There's 380 residential units, commercial and retail space. And Lincoln, Lincoln has made a commitment in the areas of local hiring, local material sourcing, and apprenticeship. And now, with some encouragement from your district uh, council member, a city staff is working even closer to make sure that Lincoln Properties keeps the commitments in that development agreement. Also, you heard from the Playhouse uh, District. A lot of exciting things are going on in the Playhouse District. I feel a special need to reach out because I had heard that there were some grumbling that I didn't give a lot of love to them. 
So I'm giving love to this area. That's why we're here tonight. I'm giving love. And I want to make sure that your concerns are integrated into the overall concerns in District 3. And I say that uh, without the joking. I say that very seriously because we are one community. The YM YWCA RFP process is moving forward. I am told by the city manager that he expects that request for a proposal to be on the street this month. As you know, the YWCA has garnered a lot of uh, community uh, participation, outcry for some, but certainly we're all focused in making sure that that asset is not only preserved, but enhanced. And we think that process is uh, going to help us do that. Then a uh, measure I funding, that's approximately $20 million of tax, uh, sales tax dollars that will be coming to the city. Approximately $7,000 of that will be shared with the Pasadena Unified School District. Now, this isn't final. This is a recommendation by the city manager as it relates to where the remaining $14 million is going to go. So the city manager is recommending as a part of the fiscal year 2020 budget that $9.4 million be put to longstanding capital projects and that $3.5 million be used to balance the operating budget. Now, I don't want to get into where I think we need to go uh, because it is in some respect is a broader vision and it's not a very comfortable vision because I think there needs to be a moratorium on certain hiring in the city to make sure that we're not just good for four years, but that we're good financially for 10 years out. I think it's very important that we look now, and we're going to be looking to Mayor Terry Tornick, not in his role as mayor, but in his role as chair of the Finance and Audit Committee to lead the city council to a better place in the context of spending the limited resources that we have to ensure that our city doesn't meet the fate of other cities, that we're financially sound today and into the future. And I say that in the context of the difficulties of growing pension obligations. They're not going to stop, they're not leveling out, and they keep inching forward, and we've got to address it as a community. How we address it has to be a, in my view, a public process that involves your assistance. Heritage Housing Partners. It's a development at the northeast corner of Lincoln and Orange Grove, and that's going to be 35 units and 2,500 square feet of retail. If that can expand their site by acquiring the village market, they will provide 45 units and 7,500 square feet of retail. They anticipate providing units for a range of income, including incomes which are 80% of the adjusted, um, is that monthly? No, moderate income units, and then 110% of AMI, and workforce units at 125% of AMI, uh, for families of four can have a household income of up to 55,000. That's 110% of AMI. Family of, I think I have that right. And then HHP has met with a number of community groups. They're in the design review process. They anticipate Perry's Joint will be the anchor tenant, and Perry's Joint is currently located at Montana in Lincoln, not to steal a, a retail entity from council member, soon to be Vice Mayor Tyron Hampton, but we just welcome the best in District 3. So Perry joint, Perry's Joint will hopefully be the anchor tenant, and they expect groundbreaking in the first quarter of 2020 and to complete construction in the second quarter of 2021. All of you have been concerned about what's 
going to occur at Fuller Seminary. And we understand that the Fuller property or the Fuller representatives have identified a possible buyer for the majority of its property. Fuller has not disclosed any further information to the city other than to expect the campus to remain essentially intact. As it relates to Chang Commons, uh, that's one of the areas that's been in dispute about making sure no matter what happens that those units stay affordable units. Uh, city staff has taken the position that it's required that those units remain affordable and that is certainly my position as one of the policymakers. And so please pay attention with us to ensure that that actually happens. We've already talked about Robinson Park. I hope that all of you will take the time to visit Robinson Park and just see the extraordinary commitment that this council has made to Northwest Pasadena. It has not been easy with competing resource, competing um, obligations. We have a capital improvement budget where there's like six or seven hundred million dollars of capital improvement projects that we don't have adequate funding for. But this council took in some respect a risk and has invested, when it's all said and done, a little over $20 million in Northwest Pasadena. We really need to applaud the council for doing that. We really do. Uh, and my colleagues. And, and, and I, I don't want to take the credit because it was all of us working together. You expect me to be an advocate for the issues that are important, that are important to you. That's why I listened to you, and that's why I fought so hard for the additional funding that Steve Mermel and others found to do the pool and the pool house and the basketball courts outside. Now, is that only for Northwest Pasadena? No. It's a community asset, and all of us need to enjoy our taxpayer dollars and other creative financing to bring such high quality projects to our community. Let's see. I think we're almost there. Uh, oh, I would like to spend just a moment, particularly for our seniors. Our seniors are some of our um, gems, gems in our community. And shortly, I suppose at the age of 58, I will be considered a junior senior, a junior senior. Not a senior, a junior senior. What's all that chatter out there? So at the Jackie Robinson Community Center on May 16, at 2 p.m., the Senior Talent Show will feature sing seniors singing, dancing, and showcasing other talents. This event, which will be held at Robinson Park Recreation Center, will be in honor of the late Otis Knox, who was one of the founders of this annual event. So I hope all of you, not just seniors, but all of you will consider uh, joining that fun activity on May 16th. Then there's an upcoming excursion for seniors include a trip to the Natural History Museum, which is next to the USC campus. It's a state-owned campus where you'll see a host of uh, different state-run organizations. And I assume that many of you have already been there, but like Natural History is there, um, uh, African American History and Museum is there, and a whole host of other museums on that campus right across the street, just south by a number of yards to the University of Southern California. And May 29th, oh no, on May, June 26th, there's a trip to Catalina Island and the bus departs from the Jackie Robinson Center and in Council Member Gordo's district, Villa Park. I wanna remind all of you that the Walt Jackson Hot Meal Program still is taking place every Wednesday 
from 5 p.m. to 6 p.m. And that's a way for us to demonstrate that we care about those who don't have um, the resources for a hot meal sometimes. And Robin Selzer and others invite us to actually serve the community. And so if you have some spare time, feel welcome to come to uh, Jackie Robinson Center and participate. Then at Jackie Robinson Center, we have Pro Bono Legal Services Clinic, the second Saturday of every month from 9 a.m. to 12 noon, free legal consultations with actual California barred attorneys. No appointment is necessary. So please tell your friends about that. I think that's a critically important resource, particularly for those with a limited income. And then, as most of you know, Sus Susana Porres is not bilingual, but trilingual. She speaks French, Spanish, uh, English, of course, and I'm told that she's learning a little Swahili. But French classes are every Wednesday from 1 p.m. to 2 p.m. and Spanish Conversation Club every Friday from 1 p.m. to 2.30 p.m. Both classes are free. And lastly, just for tonight, Project Wraparound, free short-term counseling and mental health care coordination services for youth and families. And we as a community, and I mean all of us in the room remaining, need to think about what we are going to do to take away the stigma of discussing mental illness in an environment that's not accusatory, but is an environment that is uplifting and empathetic. And I know that all of you in this room know someone who needs those types of services. And I know that some of us in the room have partaken in those services and they have helped enrich our lives. We should not be ashamed, but we should be in a position to help others who need those services. So, if you know of a youth or a family who needs those services, I'd like to provide you with a number that can assist those families, and I'll give you a second to take out a pen. And if you don't get the number, certainly Susana Porres or Tina Rios in my office will be able to provide that number to you as well. And that's called Project Wraparound. The telephone number is 626-744-6339. Six two six seven four four six three three nine, And then finally, just in terms of the Robinson Park, swim lessons and recreation swimming returns to the park this summer. The pool will be open June 10 to August 8. Early bird registration for swim lesson begins May 11. For residents and PUSD students, an open registration begins May 13. Swim lesson scholarships are available to qualified applicants. For more information, please call 626-744-7330. Again, 626-744-7330. And we have two summer camps that will take place at Robinson Park. There's a traditional camp that's June 10th to August 2nd for five to 12 euros, and the cost is $75 per week. There is also the sports camp for eight year olds to 13 year olds, and the cost, unfortunately, is $150 per week for residents, and sports includes baseball, basketball, conditioning, flag football, not tackle football, flag football soccer, golf, and tennis. There are a limited number of scholarships, so don't be discouraged. Just have your friends, uh, have their children get in early uh, in terms of if there's a need for a scholarship. 
And then lastly, we have a new fitness center at Robinson Park. Teen and seniors cost is approximately $20 a month membership and adults $60 for six months membership. Now, there's no place in Pasadena but Robinson Park where you can obtain a $60 six month membership. And the equipment is maybe a step down from 24 hour fitness, but it's new, it's clean, and it's more than adequate to meet the needs for most people in my opinion. My opinion when I say most people. So, that's pretty much it in terms of where we are. Don't forget about the flamingo, uh, do you call it flamenco dancing? How do you pronounce it? Flamenco? The, you know, dancing. Okay, flamenco dancing, hip hop, guitar, Aikido martial arts, ballet for toddlers, aerobics, folkloric yoga boot camp, and self-defense for women, for adults and senior weightlifting. All of that is taking place in District 3. So without further ado, if there are not any other announcements, I'd ask the, yes? Oh, yes, thank you. I've just been informed that there's something else. And I do have a note. Um, some of you have observed that there have been improvements in the District 3 newsletter, and it has a new look, it has a new feel. My comments are probably too long there as they are too long tonight. However, we're trying to update, make more relevant the newsletter, and we need all of you and your friends to sign up to receive the newsletter online. Leading the effort to revamp, if you will, the newsletter has been Susana Porras and her team of volunteers, as well as city staff who works for uh, Mark Chomsky, our city clerk. And so we're very grateful for the changes, the updates, and we're gonna listen to you. We wanna know what you think. We wanna know how to be more relevant to the needs that you have. And then lastly, we're accepting applications for District 3 interns, so I'd hope that you encourage young people who need that um, on their resume, who you think can do a good job for District 3, and I think a recommendation either from the mayor or the District 3 council member can be rather effective in certain environments seeking a job. So with that, I would like to introduce the senior pastor of New Revelation Missionary Baptist Church. And let me say, for those who are not um, religious in any way and sometimes are offended by the fact that we pray, please don't be offended. If you don't want to participate in the Pledge of Allegiance or in any prayer that is offered, whether it be for those who practice Judaism, Hinduism, Buddhism, uh, Christianity, uh, please know that no faith is required to participate. And I'm not apologizing, but I want you to feel welcome. And if there are other ways other than anything religious, just maybe someone who would like to read a poem or affirm the goodness that exists in District 3, I'd hope you'd approach me and give that opportunity for that type of um, affirmation to be heard in a District 3 community meeting. So I've heard some of you loud and clear in reference to the religiosity aspect of um, uh, our meetings. Uh, and I respect your right to voice your concerns, and I hope I respect your right as it relates to uh, you have uh, certainly the right not to participate in any of those activities if they offend you. Um, with that, New Revelation Missionary Baptist Church has a number of programs that are not religious, that are community outward facing, that are not African American oriented, they are community oriented. And certainly, 
Reverend Turner is probably the most senior active pastor in our community. And we want to recognize him as he um, matures and still provides a meaningful voice, a meaningful voice of leadership in our community and to his congregants. So we welcome him tonight uh, as one of the most senior pastors in our community. Won't you give him a round of applause and just welcome him? To our honorable and esteemed John Kennedy, Vice Mayor, City Councilman, I am honored and delighted to have been invited tonight to come to close you in prayer. If I'm permitted, I'd like to preface my prayer with a couple of congratulatory remarks on one, the leadership of this city, a great mayor, great city manager, great attorney, great police chief, great fire chief, and great council members. Pasadena, by far, is the greatest city that I know in the state of California. And I've been here 58 years. I have had opportunities to visit other cities, but there's none with the diversity and the care, the qualities that I have found in the city of Pasadena. So with that, I am delighted to share with you um, your closing uh, performance as vice mayor, but not as city councilman. And to join with all of us here to celebrate uh, your birthday that's coming up in, a, in another day. Please be sure that when all of you work together, great things are bound to happen. And prayer, I believe, is a motivating factor to whoever your God is. Our Lord and our God, how thankful we are for this moment and all of the wonderful works that Councilman Kennedy has performed in this community, both as vice mayor and as city council of the third district. Many wonderful works has been completed and we thank you for his service and for his sacrificial service that he has rendered in this city. We are the better because of his life and legacy home brewed, home grown, and who has returned to this city to give leadership. We pray that others will follow in his path. And now unto the God of our Savior, be dominion, power, and majesty, both now and forever, and until we meet in a better world. And all the people of God said, Amen.